Hi, love. I am thrilled to talk with you today about our egos. <laughs> and one of the reasons I'm thrilled to talk about a topic that I think um, people judge quite a bit, right, is because... When we don't have a deep understanding of a concept, I think our default is to shame and blame ourselves or other people around it. And I think when we get into the nitty gritty of egos and how they work for and against us, um, that it will create some space for you to have a little more grace, a little more self-acceptance, to tweak your process a little bit, and to generally speaking, just kind of feel better about who you are and this life that you're living and and how you live in love and all the things, right? So I love it when we can tackle a topic and shed greater light on it so that you can deepen your process and feel easier about yourself and have more mastery, right? Like we're here to build confidence. We're here to grow. We're here to mm, just like feel better and do better both right like not feel better without doing better but by doing better we automatically feel better so I'm thrilled for this topic today all right so what inspired me to want to talk about ego well it's like a component of our psychology that I think we don't have a real great mastery of and I think part of that is because we've weaponized it there's a lot of ego involved in narcissistic personality disorder and NPD has become such a popular topic and way for us to hate on a certain group of people and it's probably become a way for marketers to sell more of certain products. I don't I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think that because ego tends to be so closely linked to NPD, I think that we've lost some of the richness in the context that is there for us to all know and understand ourselves better. And so I often see ego as being a part of our psychology that we don't have a great understanding around and therefore we let it derail us in our healing process because we don't, we don't know to look at it, right? We don't need to be checking for it. And so we talk uh, quite a bit on the pod, I would say, about victim consciousness, right? And I think that's kind of a hot topic out there. But do we all know that victim consciousness is a reflection of an ego state? And do we know how to spot that in some of the ways that I don't, quite frankly, hear talked about on the internet, right? And if I haven't heard it talked about on TikTok or on Instagram, like it's probably not being talked about a lot <laughs> in those popular culture spaces. So, so let's dig in. Okay, so when we talk about ego... I let's first like kind of think about what it is and where it came from. Okay, so in the early 1920s, Freud, Sigmund Freud, starts talking about the ego as a part of our psychology, right? And then later on down the road, Carl Jung starts exploring the concept of ego in other ways and so on and so forth. It gets born into psychology therapy, psychiatry, right? Uh, some of our ways of understanding ourselves and relating to ourselves and working through um, our neuroses, let's say. And so the early 1920s is where ego becomes part of the conversation about our psychology. And since then, other people have kind of picked up that torch and run with it in various ways and spaces. Um, I think it's an important part of the conversation. And I want to put it into context from you from my clinical experience, my personal experience, so that it becomes a conversation that is relevant to your life, right? I feel like we're doing a thing where like you go to church so that the preacher can make the Bible relevant to your life. Here we are on the pod talking about like an early psychological concept in a way that can make it relevant to your life. Okay. So the ego. When I think of ego, I immediately go to watching my daughter learn how to walk when she was a tiny tiny human, right? Because what ego is, it's a sense of self-importance and it provides us with a sense of capability before we have developed the confidence as a result of a lot of practice, right? So ego is the thing that allows us to like just go for the thing before we've actually become confident enough to master it. So when my daughter is learning how to walk, She's not all up in her head about what if I get it wrong? What if I can't? What if I fall down? It's just like she just goes for it, right? She just does the thing. And ego is the part of our psychology that facilitates us taking on new tasks before we're going to feel good about it, right? It's like this part that says, no, I'm important enough. 
I can do this. I can, right? I can is like so much of how the ego functions. And it's beautiful because ego is part of what allowed me to publish this podcast before I was good at podcasting. You know, ego is the thing that allows us to believe in ourselves before we have the data to support the thing. It can compensate when we feel really insecure, right? So it's like, oh, it's this beautiful part of our psychology that allows us to take on things before we feel really, really capable to do them. Okay, great. So where does ego go wrong? Well, I think that ego goes wrong to do with the dose and the potency. What? <laughs> well, I think that when I think about any substance, any, any medicine, right, is it can, be, it can be useful in a certain dose and potency, but when the dose or the potency is wrong, it can become toxic, right? So a certain amount of nutmeg provides beautiful health benefits and a nice flavor to my coffee or to my baked goods, but too much nutmeg can become lethal, <laughs> right? So it's like dose and potency of a thing matters. So we're gonna get into dose and potency of ego quite a bit today, right? So... When you are going through a divorce, ego is automatically going to be activated because what is the ego invested in? Well, it's invested in being right, it's invested in winning, and it is invested in you, the unis of it, right? I, ego is like I. And so when you're working on teasing your life apart from your ex, there's a lot of I going on there, right? It's like, what is mine? What is for me? What do I need? And that is an essential part of the teasing your life separate, right? But where dose and potency becomes toxic with the ego when you're getting divorced is where that I, me, wants to hurt them, right? Where it wants to have power over them, where it wants to win at all costs. So no doubt your ex's ego is activated as well, right? And um, we've all heard the phrase, feed the ego. And that is a wonderful phrase to really get a beat on in this episode, right? Because how many times have you fed someone's ego in order to get your way or in order to de-escalate a situation, right? And it's not wrong to feed someone's ego. It's not wrong at all. In fact, it's a good chunk of what I often am doing in therapy. <laughs> I am really boosting certain parts of your identity so that your ego can actually say like, oh, okay, I don't have to get so defensive here. I don't have to get so competitive here. I don't have to feel like I have to win at all costs right here because I feel important enough. Okay, so, so feeding someone's ego has a beautiful place and it is valuable, but then we have to understand where in dose and potency that can become problematic, right? I think so often where things can become high conflict in a divorce is when actually a codependent, and and we could call it someone on the narcissistic spectrum, right? But where those people are separating their lives out and the person who's more narcissistically oriented, who's used to the codependent adapting, who's used to the codependent feeding their ego can become very inflamed when that behavior stops, right? When no one's feeding my ego and I'm used to getting those hits, when that stops, I can get very angry. I want my dose, right? I want my dose. Now, where I see ego become a problem in a healing process is when you don't realize you're activated in your ego and it's blocking your ability to become humble and curious and get shifted back into your heart center. When we're locked and loaded into ego, we are not grounded in our heart center, right? Where it's more of like, okay, I'm not feeling fully secure. I'm not feeling fully confident. So I'm going to click into this egoic place. I'm going to shut down my more sensitive parts and I'm going to go for it, right? I'm going to hunker down and I'm going to go for it. Okay. Well, to really heal from heartbreak, to really get clicked into divine power, ego can't be the predominant force, right? Because ego is like, Ain't nobody got time for sensitivity here. <laughs> ego is like, I'm going to learn how to walk and I'm going to fall on my ass and I'm not going to care, right? So, so where I see healing get derailed is when you forget to shift out of ego and into your heart center. You forget to shift out of, I don't need to beat my ex. 
I just need to disentangle myself from my ex so that I can get grounded in my heart center, so that I can get tapped into my divine power, so that I can move on with crafting, intentionally manifesting a beautiful, amazing life because my ex is choosing to not do this work, right? So too often we just get too far down the road of ego and we forget to check it. Now, where I think that this is a problem for probably a good deal of listeners is the good codependent doesn't know that codependency is rooted in ego. What? Yes. Okay. So a good codependent gets their ego fed from being self-sacrificing, from being the one that takes such good care of others from feeding off of the ego of those people that she loves and supports, right? Being associated with people who have high amounts of ego, right? There's like, um, here I am so proud of my children and I'm going to self-sacrifice for my children because they are so amazing and I am getting an ego boost from sacrificing for them and from their successes, right? But all of that is still denying and not living fully into your own divine gifts. And it's not living into your own divine purposeful calling. Maybe part of it, right? Like we do have callings to sacrifice for other people at times from being good caretakers, but not in a way where we're not taking good care of ourselves, That's when you know dose and potency is off. And when producer Joy and I were in our noodle session prepping for this, she did such a beautiful job of putting these pieces together for herself, of recognizing when there was that feeding of the ego from recognizing that self-sacrifice becomes a an egoic banner from which you live under, right? Like, I am such a good girl. I am such a good mom. I am such a good partner. I am good. I am important because of these roles that I have, but not good at understanding my needs and meeting them. Because understanding my needs and meeting my needs is the key to self-love, the key to being heart-centered, the key to true sustainable joy and passion that is not dependent upon someone else's success. When my well-being, when I hinge my well-being and my success to somebody else's success, right, that's not sustainable. It leaves me wide open to be a victim to somebody else saying, oh, you no longer have access to this supply and now you automatically feel like shit about yourself because you're no longer feeding your ego from lifting me up. I hope that made sense how I said that. So often the good codependent gets their ego fed from lifting up other people. And it's because some of us, right, From a place of ego, go to I am important and take on that air of arrogance of not considering other people's needs and going to that extreme self-important place. But some people just go the other way with ego, right? That I'm going to get all of my self-importance from serving you. And it's to the exclusion of of serving myself in a meaningful, loving, self-caring, honoring the temple, the design, the creation, the creator that I am, right? So it's like, again, serving others is beautiful. It's dose and potency, right? When I am not doing it in balance with loving myself well, I am clicked into the other end of the ego stick. And so it's so important to be able to feel when We have substituted ego for a sense of divine worth and purpose. And don't get me wrong. Yes, socially, we are influenced heavily by egoic concerns, right? How it looks, how it looks, how it looks. We spend so much time serving how it looks versus serving our deepest needs and our deepest purpose. And so then that is a great way of recognizing when it's ego. If you're serving from a place of how it looks versus what is truly needed and called for from a divine power place, 
you are clicked into ego and you are blocking your own healing. And so it's truly an act of faith to shift out of ego and into the vulnerable, humble place of saying, well, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to do all of this well, but I'm going to take the steps to grow my confidence via practicing, via trying it, right? Via saying, I don't know how I need help. And so I think one of the things that blocks us from shifting out of ego and into our heart centers is we think that saying I don't know how or I'm not good at something is weakness. And and I think that is not correct. I think the weakness is our fear, right? Our activated fear is the weakness. Saying I don't know is very courageous. Saying I need help is very courageous. That is the initial steps to growth and to expansion is to saying, teach me how to do something I don't know how to do. That is the path to progress, baby. Feeling afraid to do that and therefore not doing it and relying on ego to protect you from that process is the opposite of growth. It's stagnation. It's shrinking. It's avoiding the calling to our greater purpose. Whether we're in a place of, I feel better than that asshole, or I feel not as good as her, they're both egoic. I feel not as good as her is so ego compared to, wow, she's got a skill set I have not mastered yet. You are not less than anyone out there, love. But there may be people who have skill sets that you have not mm, had the courage to lean into yet. And so how can you get there short of walking that path out? Because I promise you, anyone who has a skill set that you long for, they did not get there easy. You know, like, sure, do we all have aptitudes that kind of come naturally? Like, Producer Joy has this beautiful ability to make artistic things, and that is not my skill (laughs) set. But I also know from watching Producer Joy practice the art of painting and watercolors, right, that she doesn't feel good about it right away. For her to feel confident about having created something, it has taken her practice. And so nobody that has mastered a skill set has gotten there without feeling wobbly. There's kind of no escaping that, right? And And so it's like how much ego is activated while you're walking that wobbly process is going to determine how good you feel about it or not. Because when we're trying new things and that ego is loud, oh man, the new things process feels like shit. Because the ego is constantly commenting on what an awful job you're doing. Because it wants to be right, it wants to be win, win, it wants to be perfect, it wants to, wants for it to look good. And learning is not a process that we celebrate as looking good in this culture. Now, don't get me wrong, in other cultures, I think that is more acceptable, right? But in the current culture we are living in, in this country, is I mean the United States by this because I know we have listeners all over the world, right? But in, in the United States, the messy process of learning is not something that has been widely, sub- widely celebrated. That's why the Barbie movie is so popular because it gets it the acknowledgement of that that life is actually really messy and we're all pretending like it's not and it's bullshit and so I want you to notice the places where you can feel this better than less than egoic concept and I want you to practice relating to it as your sweet sweet ego (laughs) and I say sweet sweet ego because Right. It's disarming to think of it that way. Like, oh, there you are, sweet, sweet ego. Right. Trying to help me win. Trying to help me feel important. Trying to help me not feel small and incompetent and incapable. But but we also have to practice helping that sweet, sweet ego be part of our process with a dose and a potency that serves the greater good. Right. And so I promise you that insecurity and ego are very closely linked. 
and that in the early days of trying to disengage ego, that it is one of the trickiest things you will ever do because ego can convince you that you're going to die. <laughs> like, meaning like you're going to die of mortification. You're going to die of feeling insecure. You're going to die from embarrassment. You're going to die from, you know, having flaws. And that looks different for all of us, right? For one piece person, it's it's their hair. For another person, it's their skin. For another person, it's how they perform at work. For another person, it's how they mother or how their centerpieces on their table look. Like it's, it looks different for all of us, love, right? But how the ego shows up and makes you feel like you're going to die if somebody else can see your vulnerability, like love, that's your ego. So if you're someone like, for instance, producer Joy, who was coming into helping me prep for this episode and was like, I don't have an ego. I, what, what am I going to learn from today? <laughs> right. Anywhere that you feel like you're afraid you're, that you could just die from somebody seeing your flaws. For some people, that's crying in front of other people. Can you relate to that? That someone seeing you crying just feels like you could just die. <laughs> that's all ego love. Right. And so. We're here to make friends with the ego today and to, to cultivate a more robust relationship between self, right, the higher self, the wise self, and the ego, which helps us tackle things that are not, uh, that we, we haven't mastered yet. And so I want you to like take a breath right now, right, like a big, deep, juicy, delicious breath. And it may take a few for you to really like settle into that, to that breath, and I want you to do a body scan and I want you to find the felt sense of ego. You know, from time to time, producer Joy and I will laugh about kind of um, loving to feel like we won about something or we were right about something or like somebody else is like getting a little bit of karma, right? We love that feeling. That's ego, right? And so in that little, in that, in that dose and potency, it's not dangerous yet, but it's approaching danger, right? I want you to feel how it feels to gossip about someone else. Find that sense, that sensation in your body. That's ego approaching a dose and potency that's dangerous. I want you to find the part of you that wants to hurt other people. It probably only lives in very specific spaces, right? But that's dose and potency of the ego gone too far, right? And so we were chatting a bit in the prep for this session about how to identify evil because I think a lot of times I've been kind of playing around with Christianity and scripture and whatnot and religion in general lately, right? And and I think too often in certain religions, the the ego gets vilified as like evil. And I think it's really important to not do that because the ego is part of God's design, right? It is part of the design. It is meant to help us compensate for certain deficits, right? Until we can grow that confidence. So it's a beautiful part of our God-given design. And if we call it selfish or evil, we are now shaming ourselves or suppressing a part of ourselves that's very valuable and an essential part of the design. And so I am not here to advocate for selfishness or selflessness because they're both ego gone too far. And I think that part of our difficulty as a culture in defining what is selfish versus what is self-love is the concept of the ego having been framed in certain religious contexts as evil. Now it has the susceptibility to, with the wrong dose and potency, to become the embodiment of evil, right? Because an ego unchecked can hurt. It can steal, kill, and destroy, right? The ego is what leads to co-parents who are in a high conflict situation to weaponizing their children, to using their children to try to get back at their ex or try to control the narrative or try to this, that, and the other, right? That is the ego way too far in dose and potency. So rather than vilify any part of ourselves that leaves us feeling vulnerable, wobbly, embarrassed, mortified, insecure, like we'll never make it out, right? I want you to instead look at the dose and potency and just adjust, right? And and it may feel very hard to adjust at first. And I understand that. And that's why we use tools, right? 
that's why we go to therapy. That's why we use EFT. That's why we do journaling. That's why we use the butterfly tap. That's why we go to homeopathy. That's why we go outside, put our face in the sun, our bare feet in the grass or in the earth. I don't know if your driveway counts. I literally typically, as I walk outside, tell myself to step on the earth, not the driveway. <laughs> So that I can get literally grounded. And um, this is why we move our bodies. This is why we meditate and we pray and we listen, right? I don't mean pray as in make requests. I mean pray in a way that says, um, I'm going to go get connected with my intuition and I'm going to hear my wise self. I'm going to hear my higher power speak to me. Because I promise you, ego and higher power speaking they don't like function very well on the same plane, (laughs) right? Like if you're locked and loaded into a toxic dose and potency of ego, you're probably not hearing your higher power speak to you a whole bunch, right? So lately I've been advocating for go for a big long walk without your phone, without a friend and listen for your higher power to speak to you. It will reduce your cortisol and it will upregulate your intuition. It will downregulate your ego. It will upregulate your ability to download what your higher power is trying to say to you. So here's your friendly invitation to make friends with your ego, to be able to spot it, yes, when your ex is doing it, but to also be able to spot it when you're doing it. And oftentimes being able to spot it when other people are doing it is the path over to your own recognition of self right? Use that tool. So so ego, ego run amok is like when you can spot it in somebody else and you're like, meh, smug about it, right? Ego with a proper dose and potency is, oh, I see that person doing it. I wonder where I'm doing it too, right? Right there, that little micro tweak, love, is, is recognizing your current dose and potency and adjusting. I see it in you. Can I see it in me too? And that's what it's all about. Really helping your ego come into balance is your key to healthy, loving relationships with your ex, with your children, with your family, with your friends, with whomever, your coworkers, your employers, right? It's like ego in check is really where we thrive. Not ego off, not ego disengaged. It's proper dose and potency in balance is where we thrive thrive love where you still have access to your heart center where you still can tackle new things but without hurting yourself or others so thank you for coming to my TED talk (laughs) I love you so much happy ego spotting this week peace Dear Divorce Diary is a podcast by my coach John You can find more at mycoachdawn.com.